in the small town of Oset, West Yorkshire, England, was a man named Michael Taylor. He worked as a butcher and was married to a woman named Christine. It was said he was a great and loving father and husband, and everyone loved this guy's family. He had five sons and a family dog, which was a uh, poodle. And besides a previous accident that severely injured Michael's back, which left him unable to find long-term employment, causing bouts of clinical depression, everyone in town said he was a kind and mild-mannered man. In 1974, when unemployment was already common in England, Michael found himself frequently without a job. The stress of trying to support his large family was weighing on him heavily. As the country fell into a full-blown recession, Michael was trying to deal with this deep sense of inadequacy, but often failing and going into a spiraling depression. Now, despite the issues in the household, it was not uncommon for neighbors and, and the people around town to hear a bunch of laughter and joy coming from their house. A local friend named Barbara Wardman knew they were struggling and decided to check in on the family. She was worried they were isolating themselves and did not want Michael to suffer any more from depression. To get him out of the house and socialize more, she suggested they attend an upcoming social event with her that she had actually organized. Well, it turns out this event was a religious prayer group at the Christian Fellowship Church. Now, despite most of the town being highly religious, the Taylor family never seemed really interested and mostly skipped church services. And this probably explains why it took some convincing to get him to go, but Barbara insisted it would help with his depression. So eventually Michael caved and attended. A young woman named Marie Robinson, her name is also reported as Mary in some other articles, but Marie is the correct name. She led this prayer group. She was only 22, but extremely dedicated to her religious practices. At the first meeting Michael attended, Marie fell to the ground, shaking and trembling. This was a common occurrence, but to Michael it was pretty surprising. And they told him that this meant the Holy Spirit was within her. Marie believed she was able to heal people with the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm sure you've seen, heard of these types of practices, you know, where the priest or pastor, like, hits someone in the forehead and knocks them to the ground, claiming that they are healed, and the person would convulse and flop around on the ground and then proceed to stand up, and saying they were able to see again after being blind or being able to stand up despite previously being crippled or whatever. Marie felt like she had the power to do this. And she knew about Michael's back injury and his depression as well. She thought God wanted her to heal him, and that's why he was brought to her. She asked Michael to come to the front where she stood, and he followed the orders. When another member of the church named Mavis Smith began to sob uncontrollably, Marie was torn on who to help first. So Marie knelt down in front of Mavis and began to speak in tongues. Okay. Now speaking in tongues, in case you've never heard of this, it's a phenomenon called a glossolalia by experts. It's described as a religious ecstasy or trance where the person with the gift of tongues speaks in a language no human can understand. It is said in the Bible that the person is speaking not to men, but to God. It is considered a gift in the churches that do practice this. Marie starts speaking in tongues in an attempt to exercise the demons plaguing Mavis. Michael, surprisingly enough, walks up to them and kneels with Marie and also begins speaking in tongues. This was a man who had never been to this church before, and he really wasn't even religious for that matter. So how is he suddenly able to speak in tongues? And if it was an act, how did he know how to play it off so well with them all around him? Whether it was fake or not, after that night, Michael and his wife converted wholeheartedly after being lifted by the, you know, joyous spirit of everybody in this group that they had just met. In the next few weeks, the couple attended all the meetings, and Michael started to grow attached to Marie. In fact, 
He was so taken in by her that his wife, Christine, began to grow suspicious as he started spending an inappropriate amount of time with her. He became her right-hand man, so to speak. And he would be speaking in tongues with her at meetings and helping to exercise the people of the congregation. On October 1st, he stayed up all night with Marie, uh, both of them making the sign of the cross over each other over and over to ward off the evil from the full moon. On top of the extra time with Marie, Christine said that Michael started to act differently at home. He started acting against his normal nature. He was starting to be very argumentative, irritable, and just very mean towards members of the family. He used to be very easygoing and peaceful, and his wife starts assuming that the church was the cause of this change. So during one of the congregations, Michael's wife Christine finally fucking broke. She couldn't take it anymore, and she called out Michael and Marie in front of everyone at the Christian Fellowship Church. She accused them of having this affair. And at this exact moment, Michael said that, quote unquote, an evil influence cast a shadow over him. And he ended up attacking Marie. He claims he was compelled by this evil force. He lashed out verbally and physically at her. And it got to the point that other members were concerned and had to physically restrain him because they thought he would cause her some serious harm. You know, they were really scared of this. Marie was quoted about the experience. She said, quote, I suddenly glanced at Mike and his whole features changed. He looked almost bestial. He kept looking at me and there was a real wild look in his eyes. I started screaming at him out of fear. I started speaking in tongues. Mike also screamed at me in tongues. I was on the verge of death and I seemed to come to my senses. I knew that only the name of Jesus would save me, and I just started saying over and over again, Jesus. That's when Christine heard me calling on the name of Jesus. She started saying it too, and I believe firmly that it was only by calling on his name that I was not killed. End quote. Well, while this whole thing happens, Michael claims to have no recollection of the incident, even though just previously, he even stated that he remembers feeling the sudden force of evil come over him or whatever. But the actual incident itself, he says he does not have any recollection of it. So the very next day, Marie held a congregation where she gave Michael full forgiveness and absolution for his actions. Now, while Marie may have forgiven him, the rest of the church didn't forget what happened and they kept a close eye on Michael after this. Although Michael was absolved of his sins and his outburst, his erratic behavior did not end here. In fact, it seemed to be getting worse and his sanity seemed to be slipping. More and more, this was just his normal state and he no longer even appeared to be his old self at all. Now, eventually the church turned to other ministers, telling them about Michael and they're worried the only obvious answer to the church was that he must be possessed by demonic forces for, you know, the sharp turn in his personality and all that. So eventually the local vicar came to the conclusion that an exorcism needed to be performed on Michael. So an exorcism was organized last minute, and it was probably too hastily and with, without enough preparation. Two ministers were called in to perform the exorcism. Father Peter Vincent, who was an Anglican priest, and Reverend Raymond Smith, who was a Methodist minister. Note that there were no Catholic certified exorcists here. Had there been, they would have done a psych evaluation and perhaps this would have ended differently. So at midnight on October 5th, 1974, the exorcism began. Now remember that just four days earlier on October 1st was when Michael did the all-night moon fighting ceremony with Marie, and this was before Christine confronted them in the church. So this definitely happened in a very short amount of time, just very hastily. The exorcism took place at St. Thomas Church in Yorkshire. 
The exorcism lasted over seven hours and was carried out in front of the entire congregation. As soon as it started, Michael started having uncontrollable convulsions and fits. He spit at everyone. He screamed, you know, blood-curdling screams. And if anyone came near him, he would try to bite or scratch them. Eventually, he had to be restrained, and he was tied to the floor of the church to keep everyone safe. And I'm going to bring up again the fact that this was not a Catholic exorcism, which has written rules and steps to follow, because the things that were done to Michael were excruciating. He was basically tortured for the entire time, uh, including having crucifixes shoved into his mouth and being waterboarded with holy water. Now, during all this, he still convulsed, screamed, and growled, and snapped at everybody who came near him. The priests in charge claim that during the exorcism, they found 40 demons inside Michael. The demons they found represented such sins as incest, bestiality, blasphemy, lewdness, heresy, masochism, and carnal knowledge. It's said that each demon of the 40 had to be dragged out kicking and screaming. They did not leave easily. By 8 a.m. the next day, on October 6th, the priests had to take a break due to sheer exhaustion. At this time, they said they needed to rest and would finish the exorcism later. So strangely enough, they specifically said that at least three demons remained, and those demons were the ones to represent insanity, anger, and murder. Not 100% sure why they thought waiting on that was a good idea, but, you know, whatever's clever, I guess. The congregation agreed on waiting, and although one woman in particular said she disagreed, of course, she said this specifically later, after the fact, but Margaret Smith claims she heard the voice of God in her mind warning her that the demon of murder was going to overcome Michael and kill Christine. She did beg and plead with the priests to complete the exorcism, but they pretty much dismissed her and told Michael to go home and rest before they proceeded with the next part of the exorcism, which was planned for the following day. Less than two hours after everyone left, at 9.45 a.m. on October 6th, West Yorkshire Police received a troubling phone call. Someone had seen a man walking naked through town, completely covered in red paint. The police thought this was probably a prank call and sent PC Ian Walker to the scene alone, figuring he wouldn't find anything. As he came around the corner of the quiet street, he was confronted with a sight of a man stumbling around in the middle of the street covered in what he could now see was not paint, but was blood. He was entirely covered from head to toe, and as he pulled the car up to the man, he fell to the ground and curled into the fetal position, and he started screaming, It is the blood of Satan. The man was clearly in a distressed state and making little to no sense at all. He would not answer when asked his name, and of course a scene like this quickly drew this huge crowd, and a witness identified him as Michael Taylor and told the police he had a family at home. So fearing that someone attacked Michael and the family, Walker called an ambulance and backup immediately. While waiting for the ambulance, Walker attempted to talk to Michael and calm him down, but he was still screaming and yelling senseless things about Satan. Then the ambulance arrives, and EMTs tried to examine him. He's still screaming, and he was still screaming as they put him in the ambulance and as it was driving away. So one of these witnesses gave Walker the address to Michael's home, and he jumped in his patrol car and took off heading there. When he arrived, he found that there was already a patrol car there, and apparently a neighbor had also called in and reported a commotion at the Taylor's house just a little bit before that. As Walker approached the house, he ran into his inspector, who was bent over and vomiting. He said to Walker, quote, you don't want to see this one, son. I've seen nothing like it before, and I've seen a few. It's the wife. 
She's got no, he's ripped at her, son. It's a right mess in there. There's not much of her left. You don't want to see it. End quote. Now, already feeling invested and deciding not to listen to the warning, he enters the house anyway. He had seen murder scenes and dead bodies before, and he thought he could stomach it. When he entered this house, he wished he had taken the inspector's advice, and as soon as he met with the horror like pretty much nothing he's ever seen before, it was immediately obvious the interior of the front room was destroyed with just, you know, a very quick look. Every single surface in the room was covered in blood. What was left of Christine and their dog was on the floor in the room, and the missing pieces of them were just strewn all about the room. It was brain matter, pulp, flesh, littered everywhere around this room, along with the blood. Walker asked the inspector how he did it because he then realized it was Christine's blood that was all over Michael. The inspector replied that he did not know and they had not found a murder weapon yet. They searched the house and garden, but they never found any weapon because there wasn't one. Michael did this with his bare hands. Christine's entire face was missing. It was torn off down to the bone by Michael in a fit of rage. He had also gouged out her eyes and ripped out her tongue, and she died of asphyxiation from the amount of blood in her mouth. She literally suffocated on her own blood. Next to Christine's faceless body was the remaining pieces of their family dog. Michael had ripped each of the dog's limbs out of its sockets, removed the teeth, eyes, and tongue from the dog as well. Then he stripped the dog of its fur and then its flesh. The strips of flesh from Christine's face and from the dog was what was littering the entire room. It truly was a scene from a horror movie. After the mutilation, Michael had run from the house screaming, that's when he was found by Walker. Later that day, after Michael was sedated and in a rational state, he was interrogated. While being questioned, Michael described the exorcism to the inspector. He said, It was a long night. They danced around me and burned my cross because that was tainted with the evil. They had me in the church all night. Look at my hands. I was banging on the floor. The power was in me. I couldn't get rid of it, and neither could they. They were too late. I was compelled by a force within me to destroy everything living within the house. End quote. To which the inspector then asked about the murder, and he claimed he did not remember it at all, and that he deeply loved his wife. But when asked how he felt about everything, Michael said, Released. I am released. It is done. The evil in her has been destroyed. After this conversation, Michael fell into a deep sleep. He never wanted to wake up. Uh, he did not want to basically face the consequences of what he had done. Now, despite being able to determine any motive, Michael was charged with the murder of Christine Taylor and he was kept in Broadmoor Secure Hospital while he awaited his trial. While at Broadmoor, he remained silent and slept almost constantly, hopefully reflecting on the fact that he left his five children parentless in a matter of hours. The murder and trial was an instant media sensation. In small sleepy towns where crime is rare, an intense and gruesome murder was a very exciting topic. Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction, and in this case, you'd be hard-pressed to even make this stuff up. The many news stories drew huge amounts of attention to the case. Michael's trial began in March of 1975, and at the start, the prosecutor opened with the warning that everything they are about to hear will make it difficult to believe that you are not back in the Middle Ages. And that was a quote he said. Neither the prosecution nor the defense denied the fact Michael had an obvious mental health issue that was severe 
and Michael himself testified, restating that he loved his wife and did not recall the event at all. His only explanation for the murder was that he was possessed by demons and he suspected that Christine was too. The main point the defense used was to attack the Christian Fellowship Group and their credibility. Along with those, it was the Anglican and Methodist priests who performed the exorcism. Michael's attorney described the prayer group as neurotics, feeding neurosis to a neurotic. They claimed that the prayer group was a fanatical cult and that they had used potent mind control to influence Michael, feeding into his underlying mental issues they were aware he had. They claimed he was actually targeted as an easy mark because of his history with depression. The defense also attacked the exorcism itself. They claimed that the ritual had taken a toll on Michael's already fragile mind, coupled with the warped religious ideals and beliefs that the group had instilled on him. These negative influences had pushed Michael over the edge into a realm of madness and murder. Michael's attorney was quoted as saying, quote, I am aware that it is generally regarded as improper for an advocate to express any personal feelings or opinion about the case in which he is engaged. I am afraid I find it quite impossible to observe such constraints in this case. Let those who truly are responsible for this killing stand up. We submit that Taylor is a mere cipher. The real guilt lies elsewhere. Religion is the key. Those who have been referred to it in evidence, and those clerics in particular, should be with him in spirit now, in this building, and each day he is incarcerated in Broadmoor, and not least on the day he must endure the bitter reunion with his five motherless children." End quote. The jury found Michael Taylor not guilty of the murder of his wife by reason of insanity. Found to be clinically and legally insane, he was sent back to Broadmoor Secure Hospital. Christine's death was ruled a misadventure instead of a murder, with no party ever being found guilty of anything. After two years at Broadmoor, Michael was transferred to Bradford Royal Infirmary, where he spent only two more years and was then released, apparently rehabilitated. After his release, he attempted suicide four times, and in 2005, he found himself back in court, accused of inappropriate conduct with a child. The case was so well known, the outcome did not go unnoticed. During the aftermath of the case, exorcisms were deeply looked into after there was a public outcry. The Anglican hierarchy was appalled and this was actually the last exorcism attempted by the Anglican religion. But Father Vincent's career was completely unaffected following the case. Even Vincent himself seemed to have little regard for the incident which destroyed a family and left five children parentless. The only thing he ever said about the whole situation was, God will bring good out of this in his own way. In turn, the evangelical movement was unscathed as well. They believed that the murder just further proved their point that Michael was in fact possessed. The Methodist priest, who was Vincent's partner in the exorcism, Reverend Raymond Smith, admitted that the situation had not been handled well and that the exorcism was a failure. He was quoted as saying, If people come to me in trouble of any kind... I will try to help. I would give such comfort as I could, but I am only an ordinary human being with human failings. So what became of Michael Taylor when all of this was said and done? After he was released, he went back to live in Oset. Although I can't uh, even imagine how that was possible, there were no reports of how other residents took this or how the relationship between he and his children was or if there was even a relationship at all. As stated earlier, he still struggled deeply with depression, and I'm sure the events of that night in October haunted him as he attempted to kill himself a total of four times. 
These attempts included slitting his wrists and jumping off a bridge, during which he once again injured his back very badly. It is said he still acted oddly and had bouts of uh, depression and anger. He actually did stay out of the papers until 2005 when he was arrested for the inappropriate sexual conduct with an underage girl. At his trial, the police stated that Michael took full responsibility for his actions and then asked, Am I going to Broadmoor for murdering my wife? He ended up spending a week in custody over these charges, and while he was incarcerated, his symptoms from 1975 reappeared again. But as soon as he was bailed out, they disappeared. The judge decided his previous case had no bearing on the current one, and he was deemed a low risk for reoffending, and he was given a relatively light sentence of three years with the condition of psychiatric treatment. Not much is known about what happened to him after this. As you can imagine, this case has sparked many debates. Can a human really downward spiral so sharply that they have an intense break with reality and literally rip another human and dog to shreds? This is the woman he married. He had five children with her. Adopted a family pet that they loved and cared for together. This happened in their family home that they built together. It's hard to believe, but it is even harder to believe that an actual demon caused him to do this. Could Michael have been possessed by 40 plus demons, causing the devil to overtake his mind and force him to rage and murder his wife? Perhaps there were demons, and the demons were not spiritual, but Michael's own demons he had been fighting for years. We will never truly know. But after researching the Catholic ways of exorcism, I do believe that uh, had the exorcist from the Vatican been consulted, this never would have happened. They have so many checks and balances to make sure the patient is mentally and physically stable. I think something the world can gather from this is that all exorcisms need to be carefully watched and evaluated. Of the people most affected by this case, obviously the children have suffered the most. There are no statements available from any of them. But another person who was greatly affected was the PC Ian Walker. I will leave you with a quote from him, given a few years after he retired. Of all the incidents in which I was involved in 30 years of police work, Nothing affected me like this one. The stupidity and futility of it all. The complete and utter waste of life and destruction of a family, not to mention the death and other traumas, are far beyond anything else I have ever come across. Obviously, my wife asked questions, but there are some things that you do not take home, and this was one of them. However, within the next 24 to 48 hours, the news hit the national newspapers and the TV news bulletins. You just bury it and get on with your life as best you can. Before this event, I was agnostic, and now I am an atheist.